okay so uh, thanks for a very nice talk and i think very interesting results to me i mean these are all new to me uh, okay so we take questions uh, i think raja has a question so i'll let him uh, ask yes, it first raja. Oh, Please. thanks a lot. Uh, no, actually, uh, Pinaki there has clarified that in terms of next slide. So, if I understood you correctly, uh, Pinaki sir, uh, basically these the Nikodemus kind of plot. How to really explain it in the perspective of physicists? And usually, physicists go with the spectrum, and you are trying to connect these humps and bellies. What we are trying to see, uh, if I can really look at the dissipative kind of correction. for my spectrum then i will be in a position to capture these bellies of this nicker days and if i have this inertial range kind of energetic range kind of spectrum correction if i can include it i will be in a position to calculate these humps and that is the way more or less i will be in a position to tackle these rough walls or am i wrong at some point okay so uh i would say that uh, so some part of some parts of it is are correct but uh, let me first clarify one thing even the very idea of um, the blasius and strickler scale so the the smooth scaling and the rough scaling those exponents connecting those exponents with the spectrum that is also a new idea that we introduce so prior to this work there was as far as i am aware no uh, work that actually tried to explain the blasius and the strickler scaling by connecting it with anything related with kolmogorov right right there I was so to, but there was one attempt at least to explain the blasius scaling and uh, that is to in fact again kind of approach it from the prandtl kind of an idea which is that you look at the mean velocity profile and you okay. argue that well perhaps the mean velocity profile it gives a good fit with some kind of a power law and if mm -hmm. you fit a power law there then you will get a power law for the friction and that's basically the approach that people had used before but other than that blasius was really it's like a fit and right why the exponent is 1 over 4 who knows it was that kind of a thing so both the blasius and strickler scaling being connected with kolmogorov was itself a novelty of this approach and then on top of that we introduce additional novelty by looking into what the effects of dissipative and energetic corrections are right right thanks a lot is really wonderful work and i'm very happy to read further and learn about these works thank you oh, that's very kind of you thanks uh, so can i ask the next question uh, please go on yeah so so thanks thanks a lot pinaki for very fascinating talk i think it's probably for me at least this is the best talk in this <laughs> series of <laughs> online reverence <laughs> seminar uh, not only from <laughs> from research point of view also from <laughs> teaching point of view when i'm teaching this to students uh, especially when i'm trying to relate the energy spectrum uh, to the engineering concepts i think i'm going to uh, i mean uh, ask them to read some of your papers so so the question is that uh, this hump and the belly uh, they come into picture or you were you were able to get them in, in the model uh, when once you include the energetic energetic range and the dissipative range so how does including the energetic range lead to the hump what is the physical picture behind that mm -hmm. and similarly so so why do we see a increase in friction factor if we mm -hmm. include the the energetic range and similarly why do we see a belly if we include the dissipative range okay so i think the answer to that it's a little bit tricky but let me try to see if i can explain it okay. so let us start with not including it yeah. so if i simply have the inertial range exponent throughout and i calculate the dominant eddy being some kind of a combination of these two extremes then i am just going to get a friction behavior that smoothly goes from one end to another so what is it that i am actually then doing here i am for for when i'm over here i'm in the smooth limit meaning my dominant eddy s is something quite small it's scaling with eta the kolmogorov lens scale the viscous lens scale and when i'm over here at the range of the strickler scaling 
my small s, the dominant eddy is scaling with the roughness of the pi. So I'm now going from eta to the roughness of the pi. Right? And while I'm going from eta to the roughness of the pi, when I'm doing things like this, what I'm effectively imposing onto the model is that there is no loss of energy of the cascade to any kind of a dissipation. Epsilon comes all the way to eta and then just stops at eta, mm -hmm. right? All right. Now, when I introduce the dissipative correction, yeah. what we are doing is that it's not just at eta, but as I'm approaching eta, I'm going to start to get lower and lower energy. Mm -hmm. So the red one is what I was in, in the case before. Yeah. So this dashed line, but now I am going to have a smaller energy because I'm losing some energy out, right? All right. But if that's the case, then remember that if I, after all, when I calculate the energy of an eddy of, let's say this particular size, earlier I was integrating under the dashed curve, now I'm integrating under this curve. I'm yeah. going to have less energy than before. Yeah. And if I have less energy than before, it's going to be less effective at transferring momentum because tau scales linearly with the velocity of the eddy. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the model that we, that we obtained. Tau is rho times capital V, which is the mean velocity, multiplied by the velocity of the eddy, U of S. And that U of S now is now smaller because I have lost some energy because of some dissipative effects. Right. And so because of that, my friction is going to be smaller. Yeah. Right. So because of that, I'm going to have this kind of a thing over here. Okay. Same reasoning okay. goes on to explaining this part. Right. Okay. I was thinking that, okay, I'm going to have more and more energy, but yeah. in fact, yeah. geometry puts a cut to it yeah. and yes, I'm going to have a lower energy over there. Therefore, my friction goes down. So there the friction goes up because that's the hump. There the friction. So if I compare with the case of no, no energetic correction, this friction is going to just keep going blushes. Okay. And that's going to go above. Oh, and when okay. we actually do the hump, then effectively, instead of right. keep going up like this, right. I'm okay. going to go down. Right? And that's okay. why I'm going to get a maximum. Right. Otherwise, there is no maximum whatsoever. I'll just keep going along blushes forever. Right. Yeah. So this transition is the only part which sort of remains unexplained. The increase in friction factor in the transition. So that's you are asking a very interesting question. So this increase of friction factor in the transition, in fact, we can explain, but now we have to look into the fact that we are looking at the energy spectrum where effectively this behavior, in fact, here, what I'm showing you is the E11 or the um, part of the energy spectrum, which is saturating. But if you look at the 3D spectrum, it actually has the opposite behavior, which is going down. In any event, we can actually explain the transition part of the thing also just from the energy spectrum, because as you can see, you actually do get it. But the question then becomes, well, how should we understand this yeah. transition part of the spectrum, right? Now, what I've done, uh, it's, it's a separate work and it's, we published it uh, recently. We looked into transition part of the friction itself for smooth pipes. Mm -hmm. And for smooth pipes, what we found is that this transition part is in fact a combination of two, a laminar regime and a turbulent regime. And the turbulent regime is the same as the blushes, mm -hmm. but that's for smooth pipes. What it is for rough pipe, as far as I know, remains an open question. And if we can trust this model, then what our suggestion is that in rough pipes, in the transition regime, what you're going to have is not the inertial effect at all. In fact, there may not be any inertial range at those Reynolds numbers. But you're, what you're going to have in the energy spectrum is something that has no inertial range. It looks like a curve like this. And when you integrate that curve, because of the shape of the curve, you're going to have a regime where the US, the dominant eddy size is going to increase with increase in Reynolds number. And that's what is going to give you a higher friction over there. Very interesting. Yeah. 
Thanks. I have one more question, but I'll allow others to speak uh, in case they have any questions. Okay. Any other person? Okay, Abhishek. I don't see any hand. So go ahead. Uh, so this is spectrum. As far as my understanding goes, it starts coming to picture when the flow starts to transition to turbulence. Uh, so uh, is there a limit? I mean, at least in the spectrum or maybe in this graph itself, friction versus Reynolds number, is there a limit up to which we can use a spectrum? And uh, because I guess uh, once you start seeing transition, then be, uh, the scales may appear slowly. So you may have just two scales or three scales and so on and so forth. Uh, so with less number of scales, the spectrum also will look very discrete and patchy. So I wonder whether uh, using that in a regime very close to the transition would be the uh, right thing to do. I mean, right. So uh, I don't know the answer to the question for rough pipes, but I do know the answer to the question for smooth pipes because we investigated this very precise question that you're mentioning uh, very recently and we published about it last year. So let me see, I, I'm very bad with technology, so I, I might screw up, but let, let me see. I'm going to try to, it's in a different talk that I have. I'll, I'll show the slides if I can switch it quickly. So let me stop sharing this particular slide and see if I can switch my talk so I can show you these other results that we have. Is that the Proc Royce Hawk paper? Uh, no, actually, that that one investigates a very different problem. Okay. Where we, uh, this is a this is a paper where we explicitly focused on uh, transitional regime, but in smooth pipes. Okay. So I'll show you exactly what I mean. All right. So let's see if I can now start sharing again. Okay, so can you see the screen? Yes. All right, so uh, we did experiments with uh, water flowing in a smooth pipe. And here are three typical uh, velocity signals that we analyze. So these are velocity analyzed at the center line of the pipe uh, at a single position. I'm plotting this velocity as a function of time. So it's a velocity time series. If the flow is turbulent, you have all sorts of scales that are coming yeah. in. As you go down in Reynolds number, in a smooth pipe, you go from this turbulent flow to transitional flow. Yeah. And in transitional flow, there are two very different regimes. Initially, as you go down from turbulent to uh, this laminar sort of thing, you get into what are called slugs. So slugs are regions where the flow is fluctuating and it's surrounded by laminar flow, but slugs keep expanding. So this is a typical region of slug flow. And slug flow typically starts around Reynolds number of 2,500 or so. But below that and going all the way up to 1,700 or so in Reynolds number, you have yet another regime of transitional flow, what are called puffs. And those are what I'm showing here with this green curve. Again, on the two sides, you have laminar flow. And in the middle, you have some kind of a fluctuating flow but unlike slugs, they don't expand, but in fact, just move more or less keeping their shapes. Sometimes they split and there are all kinds of other interesting uh, features that they show. So here we asked ourselves the following question. If I look at the statistics of this velocity, now, in fact, in Reynolds's paper, the very title of the paper talks about very large Reynolds number, which for a mathematician is infinity. And here we are talking about rather moderate to small Reynolds number, where whether or not you're even going to call this fluctuating flow surrounded by laminar stuff as turbulent becomes a very questionable thing to start with. Yeah. All right. So what we do is we identify this fluctuating regime and we extract out only the fluctuating regime mm -hmm. from the transitional part. And of course, when the flow is turbulent, then the whole signal is fluctuating. So we analyze the whole signal. And for each of these signals, we then, so this is the idea of uh, Kolmogorov that we already talked about. And uh, this is the notion of energy cascade. So one of the things that we can conclude by 
saying that epsilon is set from large scales and dissipated at small scales yeah. is that the Kolmogorov length scale scales as minus three, three over four. And if we do that, and we calculate this eta, the Kolmogorov length scale, and to calculate eta, which is just another form of epsilon, we actually calculate the epsilon. Mm -hmm. And once we know the epsilon, then we can calculate eta using this formula for the epsilon. In any event, we can go and do all these calculations for the turbulent flow, for slugs, for puffs. Yeah. And then we plot this eta as a function of Reynolds number. Unsurprisingly, when the Reynolds number is large, here is from Princeton superpipe data, you see that eta over d scales very nicely as Reynolds to the power minus three over four. For our turbulent flows, simulations as well as experiments, we just kept going down in Reynolds number to see how far this guy would go. Mm -hmm. And it seems to go nicely with minus three over four. Surprisingly, when we go into slugs, we see effectively the eta distribution indistinguishable from a fully turbulent flow mm -hmm. distribution. Okay. Mm -hmm. And even more surprisingly, when we go to puffs, the same trend continues. In other words, the smaller scales in a puff, the smaller scales in a slug, smaller scales in the column in a turbulent flow conforms more or less very precisely to the very picture Kolmogorov had. Now, this is just the smaller scale. What about the notion of what is called small scale universality, which yeah. is the idea that if I focus my attention onto the large case, I can effectively say that E of K normalized by nu square over eta should be a universal function of eta K. That's, yeah. that's the very idea of small scale universality. Yeah. All I did previously is just to see how the eta scale itself changes. Well, we have the whole spectrum measured. Why not try it? Well, we have the values of eta also calculated. Mm -hmm. So here is what we did. We took all of our spectra. Here are some representative spectra. Here are from super pipe, where you can see nice inertial range. Here are from some puffs and slugs where effectively there is no inertial range. It's some kind of just a curve. You, know, you can't really argue that there's a minus five over three regime anywhere. Yeah. And here is the same spectra plotted in the Kolmogorov coordinates because mm -hmm. we wanted to see what gives us some kind of a reference for the universal curve, capital F. Mm -hmm. So for the universal curve, we are taking the super pipe at half a million Reynolds number. And then onto that, we plot on other super pipe data at lower Reynolds number. And as you can see, the regime where the same universal behavior happens, it's becoming smaller, yeah. but at high K, you have the same thing, but these are all turbulent flows. For our turbulent flow, same thing. For our slugs, same thing. And we can keep going down basically all the way to puffs. And you see the same thing at the small scales. It's effectively conforming to the same ideas that Kolmogorov had. So, and you can actually look at some other things also. So here are some things that we had done. And this science advances papers from 2020 is where we looked at this idea of the spectrum. But these are for smooth pipes. What right. happens in a rough pipe, we don't know. And actually in my lab, we are just setting up those experiments right now. Interesting. I'll be very keen to know your new results. Yeah, sure. thanks. Thanks a lot. I'm today. very slow with things, so I don't know when we'll have results, but hopefully. No, it doesn't soon. matter. Yeah. I'll wait. Thanks. Thanks again. Great. Sure. So, uh, anything else? Uh, then I'll ask my questions. Okay, Pinaki. So, I think uh, I have two questions. Uh, so, one critical assumption is US times the tau is US times uh, V, right? And uh, that's what you wrote the flux. Yes. Yes. Now, that seems like a dimensional argument, yeah. but... Uh, yeah, I'm still in doc. Just wait for a couple of minutes. Yeah. Sorry, what, what is that? Okay, yeah. So, US times V. So, uh, how good is that? I mean, maybe you can verify from the simulations or from experiments. I don't know. I mean, uh, you might have thought about it. Right. So, so the first thing is, in fact, if we, if we do let's say Buckingham Pi theorem with dimension analysis, right? Okay. We are not going to get that result because you're going to get a much more general result. So let me show you where that argument comes from. Okay. 
So, oh, maybe this is not working. It's working okay, yeah. Oh, it's working? Yeah, it's working oh. fine. Okay, so you can see the slide of the argument. Yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. So let's say we make a dimensional analysis argument to say that tau is a function of density, capital V, the mean velocity, and some fluctuation velocity, whatever that may be, US. Mm -hmm. So if we do the dimension analysis thing, what we are going to see is that tau is going to be a function of rho V square, rho capital V square, times some function of US divided by V. Right. Mm -hmm. We are not going to get the thing, it is US multiplied by V because both of them have exactly the same dimensions. You see? Yes. So, so that's, that's the problem of the dimension analysis argument. And the second thing is from dimension analysis, we cannot say what the scale S should be. For that, we need some geometry or something else to come in. So here, the way we made the argument is to say, you have to kind of separate rho V with US. And the way we were able to argue to separate rho V with US is to say that for the mean velocity, we are assuming this binary model that over here, no mean velocity. Outside here, there's a plug of mean velocity. Mm. And once you do that, then you build this on top of that. But now let me come to the second question that you asked, which is, can one directly verify it? And the, and the problem there is that we are effectively imposing a much more simplified thing onto this problem than is actually there in reality. Because in reality, there isn't a place where you have zero mean velocity and outside all of the mean velocity is just coupled into one thing. So in reality, you have a whole velocity profile. So I, in this talk, I described the simplest possible model that we could construct, but in subsequent work, at least for smooth pipes, we have been able to account for a whole velocity profile and then generalize these arguments that I showed you in this talk and generalize them so that we can actually account for the variation of the mean velocity at different distances and the variation of epsilon also at different differences, because after all, epsilon also has a profile. Here, all of the epsilon is just combined into a single Taylor scaling. And that's not something that's really, you can verify directly, but it's a simplification that we have imposed conceptually. So th that's how I would answer the question. Great. Now, drag reduction, no? we put polymers, of course, there's not, Part of your talk, but maybe if you thought about it, yes. uh, uh, so polymer drag reduction. In fact, I was thinking that you'll talk on that problem because I've not seen your paper before. Uh, so, do you have some thought on that? I mean, so drag reduction. I thought that friction is inside the, basically inside the bulk. Okay, your yeah, extra slides. Okay, great. Uh -huh. So, yes, I, I have given some thought to it. So, let me describe uh, some of the work here, but. Uh, this is not my work. Uh, this is uh, a work done by this group in Brazil. And what they did is they basically took this model that we developed and they generalized this model to take into account fluid with power law rheology. And then they were able to, it, it's a pretty straightforward uh, generalization where you basically have to account for a viscosity that now depends on the rheological properties. In any event, you can then get direct expressions for the Blasius scaling, which then they were able to compare with different data. But uh, to come to the point that you mentioned, uh, let me see if I can, because it's, it's been a problem that I have been interested in, but uh, because there have been some evidence at least that shows, I'm trying to see if I have that slide here that I can get to quickly. Okay. I'm not sure I have it. Anyway, so uh, the idea is uh, at least for dilute polymers, there is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like Dijan's work and other people have also worked that says how the polymer affects the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And in recent times, Ebhard Bollenschild's group is also working on this idea. And then after all, if we know how the spectrum is affected, then we can go and predict how the friction is affected. 
So mm -hmm. one of the things that I have in mind, although I don't have results for it yet, is to in fact measure both the effect on the spectrum and concurrently the effect on the friction in the same setup and then try to see if the ideas that we developed can in fact be can in fact be applied there but in principle i believe that it should be possible to extend these ideas to polymer drag reduction or for that matter drag reduction by bubbles or um, other kind of additives okay so let me just make a comment on on this uh, same uh, question so what i thought about in fact uh, the paper uh, which we wrote recently uh, so in when you put in polymers uh, the energy flux which is you wrote uq by l no? that is cascade which is going down in different scales that is the function of length now when you, because some of the energy is going down to polymers because it just stretches at different scales so the flux starts decreasing with your number. Okay. So as a result, the nonlinear term, u dot radio, when flux decreases, in fact, is less than u cube by L, mm. the flux. Mm. So the flux is decreased. So the nonlinear term, which is u dot rad u, is also decreased. Okay. Uh, and that leads to uh, reduction in nonlinear term reduce, uh, leads to smoother uh, uh, flow. Okay, it's somewhat surprising, but uh, it's a U increases because the flow becomes smooth. So that's what uh, I, well, I mean, we don't have real DNS to measure it right now, but uh, we did it for MHD. So magnetic field is connect like stretch, stretching a polymer, there are connections. And we made some, it's somewhat qualitative argument as well, I would say right now, but yeah, we made. So I think your thing looks very fascinating. Uh, so this flux, yeah, I guess right now your R is much small compared to the to the uh, large ED of the yes. flow, right? Uh, That's so it doesn't That's really correct. affect the flux. But when That's R correct. becomes uh, large, mm -hmm. then I guess the flux will get uh, affected by You're right. by yes. the by the roughness. Yes. Anyway, that's a separate problem, but yeah. Well, okay, but you I know, I mean, can... what you, what you said is quite interesting to me because. Uh, it's actually tied to another question someone else had asked, which is uh, even if we, for example, ask the question, where do the bellies come from? Uh -huh. And here it's the viscous correction or some kind of another effect that's affecting the flux and the eddies mm -hmm. that are over here are receiving less flux because some flux is lost. And the argument you're making is, well, polymers by their dynamics are taking away some of the energy. So the turbulent part of the flow has lesser energy over there. And with the shape of the spectrum, we are able to, in fact, predict how much would be the decrease in the friction. And so qualitatively, at least what you described, uh, seems to me to be very much in line with what we would predict from the shape changes on the energy spectrum. That is the decrease in flux would be conducive to a reduction in drag. Yes, yes, precisely. In fact, but quantitatively, uh, later, I, <laughs> I think it's possible. I mean, that's what I'm. Well, I wrote the paper, which uh, we can discuss further, maybe privately. Uh, and second, so for Avishek's uh, question, you know, you showed that with puffs and uh, sludge. Uh, I think, I mean, your come your result is pretty nice. I think the inertia range is five third. People emphasize on. But even the dissipation range is also universal, right? With pause model. Yes. Yes. And I think that is coming from that universality of the dissipation range with appropriate scaling uh, leads to uh, your results compactifying on that same four third line. Or like, what is that? One third line or three over four. Yeah. Three quarter line, yes. yes. You agree with that, uh, my, my understanding? Or so. Uh, let me see if I understood it right. So what you're saying is that to, for the scaling of eta, which is the Reynolds to the power minus three quarters, that mm -hmm. is much more general than having inertial range on the spectrum, which is the five thirds. Right. Oh, I fully agree with that. Yes. And yeah. at least the way I look at it, I mean, it's not a proof, but at least the way I look at it is to start with the Kolmogorov argument, including viscosity. And then yeah. see that if we, this is the so-called first similarity hypothesis. 
if we make the first assumption that you are just looking at scales that are smaller than the large scales, then you are going to get this universal function. But if you impose a second one, which is an intermediate asymptotics hypothesis, which is that not only I'm looking at smaller scales, but it has to be larger than something else. In that case, I get the five thirds. So I'm necessarily looking at a subset of the whole mm -hmm. thing. And the universal one is much more general. Right, right. But I mean, why would that exactly give you the minus three quarters? I think that's, that's rather an interesting problem. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. Great, Pinaki. So uh, thanks. So you really gave us a very good talk and a lot of ideas. So we can close now. Uh, and